Hush. I'm, I'm on a great hunt. <laughs> Get it? Worst intro yet? Probably. The Great Hunt by Robert Jordan is the second Wheel of Time book, and this will be a spoiler-filled read-through because I'm doing a read-along with my audience in anticipation of the show we might be getting at the end of this year. And once again, yes, this is the original CD box set I first experienced this story through all the way back when I was like 11, so 15 years ago. I'm old. But a quick complaint, a quick note that drove me wild as a kid, I, I genuinely hated this. Half of the CDs are intelligently designed. Both of them can't be forced out if you do this. They're nice and securely pointed in a direction where there's literally no way the CD can go flying across the room. I had multiple scratches on CDs by the end of this because as I was a child listening to these books, some of them are designed to be facing outward. So if you whip it, or if you like just pull it out of your backpack too aggressively, a CD will go skittering down your middle school hallway, uh, letting everyone know you're a giant nerd and on your CD player, you're, you're listening to fantasy books. I'm not upset about that uh, still. And yes, I'm old enough that when I was in middle school, I had a CD player and a tape player, but a lot of you aren't. I do remember the first time I was able to get a, a Wheel of Time book on my iPod Touch, and that, game changer. That was amazing. But okay, let's just go ahead and begin our spoiler discussion for The Great Hunt. This book's prologue immediately fascinated me coming in on this sixth, seventh, eighth reread. I don't even know at this point. I've been through this book a lot. But what we have is a meeting where there are dark friends and powerful players that if it's your first time through the series, I don't know if you'd 100% recognize what is happening here, but it's clear that a powerful figure within the shadow is sending dark friends after Matt, Rand, and Perrin. They wants them brought to him alive. He's not sure which is the dragon reborn yet, but the ego is on full display, a continual theme from the shadow as more people are breaking free from their prisons, as the shadow is regrouping, they already assume they are superior to any forces that could possibly be in display at work within this world. And I enjoy that. I like seeing the shadow is moving. It's more agency filled. It's a good display of threat, but we do have that inherent flaw with them where they just assume everyone is less. And that actually makes a lot of sense. Like, cause you have to remember they're coming from a time where th they had amazing technologies, S like basically technology blended with magic to achieve highs that we haven't really even achieved in the real world. And they're coming back to a world that's like Renaissance era. And so, yeah, there's a lot of like, no, nothing here's a threat to me. And I, I think that ego is actually more realistic than what I thought about it this read through. Like a lot of people I know were like, hey, if I was sent back to the medieval ages, I would like invent the steam engine. First of all, no, you wouldn't. You don't know how a steam engine works. But if you had been an inventor, if you had been someone who understood this technology, you would have that just look at these peasants mentality. But all right, so we have this perspective and then we cut to one of my favorite like opening sequences with characters in the Wheel of Time and that is Lan and Rand training and it's just, I love this because it kind of sets up Lan to have this paternal relationship with Rand. I love seeing him walking Rand through this and then we get a strange occurrence in which the air seems to grab Rand and of course Lan just beats the hell out of him with a sword and is like, what what, 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 what what, happened here, Rand? And he's like, I don't know, the, the air got solid. And for some reason on this read through, like, if magic wasn't obviously such a thing, that just sounds like such an excuse for someone who like didn't want to admit they got bested. Like, oh yeah, I'd... the air got hard. But then of course the Aes Sedai are arriving from Tarvalin and Rand decides he needs to GTFO because he can channel and this ain't. Great. We, the reader at this point, can safely know that yes, Rand is the Dragon Reborn, yet he still ends up being found and brought to the Amarlin where she tells him, you're the Dragon Reborn <laughs> and good luck. And he's like, what are you gonna do to me? And she's like, you can stay here or you can go. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna control you, which is a great, uh, upon this reread setup for how there are different 
forces at play within the White Tower. They are not as unified a front because this is made to be a kind of secret meeting with Swan, Moraine, and Rand, and there's pretty clearly, like, Swan wouldn't openly tell everyone she's doing that. Like, it's a great little politics setup and foreshadowing for what is to come. No spoilers. We also have conflict brewing within the friend group, and I... It felt a bit more forced this time to me than I remembered it being. I don't know, like, it's just kind of bugging me, like, hey, your lifelong friends talk to each other. I, you can excuse it through they're in high-stress, high-stakes situations, and they're kids, so it absolutely still is believable. And so I'm in this situation where it's like, I get the criticism that a lot of the main cast acts annoyingly, because I'm annoyed by them. I just excuse it because it makes sense within the story, and I think the conflict they have with each other here does make sense within the story. And I also still don't entirely know if Moraine was trying to force this conflict a bit by pumping Rand up so much, if she wanted there to be some kind of disconnect between them. She is a manipulator. She does do these kind of things. And so it's possible she wanted them to feel more isolated so she could have that level of control. But I don't think that's quite the case. That doesn't really benefit Moraine at all. And I think it was just her genuinely trying to like give Rand the appropriate stuff he needed for what was to come. We also have that creepy visit with Fane. There's an attack, the dagger's taken, uh, and bad juju. The blood on the wall scene, I, I liked this more than I remembered. So it always has been a great horror sequence and continues with, especially early on the Wheel of Time, there being genuine scenes of horror in this series, being very fundamental and foundational to how the world is built and the establishing tone. The full knowledge of the series and going through this, I love this scene because it shows a lot of Rand's character flaws on full display. He's very reactionary. He is a reactionary man to his core. I think that sticks with him for a long, long time. And the showdown where this Aes Sedai is doing something clearly wrong to him and is interrupted it again is just kind of showing like there's going to be problems <laughs> for the white tower and i love that robert jordan is carefully as a as a narrator planting seeds of distrust in your mind from rand's perspective and really like every every time we're in uh one of the Emmonsfield five's head there are seeds and reasons to distrust the wider forces in the world at play clearly put down it's so real. I really appreciated that about Great Hunt this time through. It's so absolutely true to human nature. God, if the last year and a half has proved anything to us, it's that people even in desperate extreme times will behave selfishly and act for their own self-interest to an extreme extent. And seeing that lay here, it just makes me realize like, yeah, Robert Jordan, uh, he had a good understanding of human psychology. <laughs> I mean, he was a Vietnam vet. I'm sure he's well aware of how institutional issues can cause horrible things to be done and bad people can get positions of power and result in all kinds of damage. I mean, I'm not trying to say anything super political here. I'm just saying like, yeah, during warfare, you're going to be taught as an individual that there are bad people at high levels. And I think that influenced how he wrote institutions throughout the Wheel of Time. But okay, the adventure really kicks into high gear and we have our party split. The women who've learned they can channel are heading to Tarvalin and our uh, boys are going off with Ingtar, a borderlander party to try and recover the horn and there's the split up where Rand tries to take a little sleepy poos and he's next to Loyal and Hiran and ends up flipping them into another world. I'll get to that in a minute. I want to talk about Perrin, Varen, and the Aiel. Perrin's growth here, I think this was the perfect setting to put his full power on display from a literal context of the story. It's just a great excuse for why he needs to explore his powers. It shows a good character thing for him where he's willing to lean into this thing he's afraid of because he knows it will benefit those around him. But on top of that, on a meta level, I like that they pulled Rand away from him so that his powers kind of, when he's exploring them, are fully in the spotlight. I'm not thinking about Rand at all. I'm experiencing through Perrin's perspective totally, you know, only on his own, what it's like for him to uh, embrace this. And it kind of, again, fleshes out the world here. And I actually thought there was a lot more world building in The Great Hunt than I remember there being. And then we have our meeting with the Aiel, who gives us a bit of just a monologue and dips, but it's, it's a bit jarring. I'm going to say there's a few events in this book that just kind of feel like things happen, but I, I, it's a fantasy book that's going to be there. And I just enjoy, while there aren't phenomenal relationships being fleshed out in this party, what there is is good individual understandings of who people are and how they sit with one another. And that's where I think Varen's character came into play really nicely. She is a 
factor where she's a bit mysterious to us at this point in the series. We don't know where she's really sitting or staying, but her being there just kind of throws this wrench into the gears where now everyone's almost on edge a little. And as they continue on, I mean, we don't get too, too much more with them outside of just some of this world building stuff and exploring the world with Perrin. As this kind of continues to shift forward, Varen, I specifically remember just being someone I did not trust. And I won't get into Mordor because spoilers, but Varen, I did not trust. Even more so than my initial reaction to Moraine when I first got into the Wheel of Time as an 11-year-old. Rand. <laughs> Randy Rand. So he ends up running to a woman named Celine. And we, at the end of this book, find out that this is actually Lanfear. And I, I, when I first read this book, of course, immediately went like, like, no, she's very evil. What I just picked up on this read-through, though, is how much of a kind of direct parallel to meeting Moraine she is. We have Moraine, who is good, and throughout her disagreements with Rand, still wants what's best for him and is working for the light, most importantly. You know, being this mysterious stranger, beautiful woman of noble descent, obviously. And then we have... Lanfear doing the same. And Lanfear's parallels to Moraine's are so clear, where Moraine is cautious. She is manipulative, but she is as transparent as she can be. Whereas Lanfear, just upon like gut instinct of first encounter, I would be amazed if anyone did not immediately go like, oh, no. Like, <laughs> is really obvious that she is someone who has a alternative intent, but because Rand is a young teenage farm boy, and she looks how she looks to the point where Loyal, who is not even her species, is like, would clap cheeks. It is, uh, it's, it's very believable that they just, like, fall under her spell. And there could be some other, I'll get into later, maybe on spoilers if I remember in later books, once a certain power is unveiled, other power at play here as well. But it's very much so Lanfear's style to try and get people to willingly, slowly over time, fall into line with her. And seeing that working here is, uh, Robert Jordan's a great character, right? <laughs> but then they get to this massive statue, but I won't get into what that is, but I wanna talk about Rand's reaction to it. It's so powerful in how it's written. Robert Jordan is able to write this fervor so strongly and I think that's one of my favorite thing about his prose. It needs to be that way for how his magic system works. His magic system is addictive. It's something that's consuming. You can accidentally destroy yourself with it. It's so driving. And having uh, this moment where Rand seems so out of control, so compulsed by this thing in front of him, uh, it, it just hit me even harder. I loved that scene. And then they get to Karian and the... Okay, so th there's some there's some criticisms. There's some criticisms that end up coming into play. I don't... <sighs> so the way the Game of Houses is presented to us is like this genius master craft, like subtle, manipulate... Rand just throws invitations and fires. And that's how he becomes a major player as a nobody within the Game of Houses. And because he burned all these people's invitations, suddenly he's like this... Ooh, we must invite him to every party. I just don't feel like a masterful political society would respect and be curious about some dumb young noble showing up and burning shit. I don't know. It just felt a little contrived. Early on Wheel of Time book, there's gonna be that stuff, but I just didn't love it. He also runs into Tom Marilyn, which is fantastic as always. Good time there. Uh, set up for tragedy, and on his way back, he runs into some Trollocs that are being paraded through the streets as puppets hunting him with dark, with dark friends. I, uh, is it comedic? Yeah. <laughs> is it effective? Still yes. It oddly works even on this read through, but it is definitely a moment where I had to like sit back and be like, Who came up with this idea? Who first did it? Who approached the Trollocs and was like, so, we're gonna puppeteer you. <laughs> I just wish we could get that conversation. I haven't talked too much about Pot on Fane. He's creepy throughout this book, he's whatever, but yeah, I don't feel too much need to say much more about him. Uh, but Rand then continues on into an Illuminator's Guild. We get introduced to the fact that there are fireworks here and guilds. 
cool. I found myself wondering uh, in this read through, what exactly does Karian look like in my head? Because Camelon, when they're there in book one, very grandiose displays of wealth, true center of trade. It's always been a combination of like London, Rome, and maybe some influences from like architecture around the world just kind of coming together. It's a true cultural melting pot for this continent, whereas Karian's not quite there. So I found myself picturing it a bit more traditional Renaissance Italian city. Don't know why Italian, but it's just in my head. But again, with some of that more traditional European, maybe Germanic influence as well, that's just the way my mind processed it. But we get back to the inn, fast forward events clashing, ah, conflict, and the inn's on fire. Hiran's been knocked in the head. I haven't even talked about Hiran yet much. And uh, the horn and dagger have been taken as everyone arrives, which is kind of funny. At this point in editing, I realized I forgot to even mention the fact that, yeah, there's a heist scene where they steal back the horn and dagger. And it just, I don't know, it's never really stood out to me as a particularly phenomenal sequence. It's fine. Uh, it's all right. It's just kind of strange that they're able to sneak in, an alarm is raised, and then they like take a good amount of time just like chilling, looking at the horn and stuff. And she's like, blow it. And I don't know. It just didn't love it. Kieran's great. I just want to say, Probably one of the best like side characters we get within the Wheel of Time. I wish he had more time within the series. He's wonderful. But okay, we then have Varen and Rand and Matt and Perrin and Ingtar blah, 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 all together. They need to go to a party. They do. It's a pretty good infiltration party scene. I always kind of thought it was like clumsy farm country bumpkin James Bond because <laughs> it comes across that way a little bit. I also love that Matt is so emaciated at this point. People are asking him like, does your does your lord feed you? We get some real actual Matt characterization coming through. So the unveiling of how great Matt is to become is uh, still on its way, but we get nice little nuggets of it. And then they're told they need to go to Tomon Head. So uh, there's then the portal teleportation that goes horribly wrong, but was a great plot choice for uh, Robert Jordan to do. Uh, we get Rand, Matt, Perrin, and all these people, Borderlanders and stuff, Varen, just living tons of different lives and kind of, I assume, getting a bit of an upgrade as a character from that. Like, they get to experience all these lives. You're going to remember some stuff. You're going to, I don't know, have those experiences in your mind. So I've always kind of justified some of their from here on out abilities to be a bit better as a sword fighter, abilities to channel a bit better, to be excused, because it's like, no, 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 they, they have vague memories of dozens of lives now in their head, so yeah, that works. And then on the other angle, we have Moraine and Elaine and Egwene on the tower, it's a great just, okay, and they've had some training, uh, which just works for them. And they're, you know, behind the scenes, friendships have strengthened up, and I need now and accepted, and I love that, that's great. Now let's go ahead and cut to them. Uh, they are introduction to the White Tower, as grandiose as it needed to be, and it never feels full-on just fantasy school, which I was afraid of going back into it. I really was afraid that I hadn't paid attention to the presentation of Tarvalin uh, thoroughly enough, and it would just come across as magic school. It doesn't. It comes across as an institution, something that guides the land, and I... I oof, thank you, Robert Jordan. Well done. Though, yes, some of the more cringy moments of like teenage flirting come about here as we meet Gawain and Galarad, though they're teenagers so that's fitting, and they are eventually sent on this mission where they are going to be brought and they are given to the Shan Chan by a member of the Black Aja, and now they are also a Toman head, uh, which comes in with another extremely convenient Rand seeing Egwene later, but he's still Varen. Right? Robert Jordan wrote plot convenience and armor into his narrative, so it's like in Marvel when Doctor Strange is like, there's only one outcome we can win. So that's why everything has to unfurl like it is. It's Robert Jordan going, they manipulate chance. So that's why all the plot convenience <laughs> happens. And we have them having confrontations with Sean Chan and how hateable the Sean Chan are set up to be is impressive. They are pieces of I hate them. They are awful. But again, because Robert Jordan's a detail to culture, you understand that your hatred from them is coming from cultural difference, where we have expectations of, you know, not being for slavery, and they are. Their culture accepts that, it promotes that, and it's this, like, 
no, you're wrong. But they justified in their heads or these people have the strength of potentially like nuclear weapons. We need to have them under control, which is a justification you could see existing in this world for the treatment women who can channel under Sean Chan get. But we have them again, breaking into a palace to try and uh, recover the horn and the dagger using Matt essentially like a bloodhound to bring them to there. Uh, they managed to get there and there is a, um, so here's where my excusing the multiple lives comes importantly into play. Rand fights a blade master. He loses it first, he enters the void, and then he comes out on top. If very specific things hadn't been done, it would just be absolutely like immersion breaking to me, because like this is a blade master and you're a farm boy. But he got tutoring from Lan, which as if you get further in the series, you'll understand. I think if Lan just spent an afternoon with me, I'd be pretty damn good with a sword. And then also that living through many lives where we see Rand was a soldier and all this stuff. I think a lot of that experience just left an impression on him. And so yeah, he could then be good enough, plus with his Talvirin and seeking the void to actually combat and fight this Shan Chan Blade Master. And I also have a justification in my head where Shan Chan Blade Masters with their super gaudiness are just actually not as good as people in the Westlands who are constantly fighting Trollocs. They are more in combat. Wars are more frequent here. I just think the individual Westlander culture promotes actually being a great sword master compared to Shan Chan, which is funny because the Shan Chan even makes a comment like, we are the superior blade man. Oh, no, we're not. <laughs> we get more displays of Shan Chan, like dedication to the empire where like servants are killing themselves because their masters are gone. They manage to get them, they go outside and then <gasps> the fight in the sky. The Horn of Valier is blown. Shan Chan are attacking white cloaks and blah, big bushing of armies just all unfurling at once. In a lesser author's hand, it would feel just kind of random, but because the world is so great, we know there's all these forces at play. It just feels natural that yes, something gargantuan will happen here because there's just these natural forces at work in the world that guide events. And so we have Rand fighting in the sky and just weird, wacky things going on. It felt, all right, I like nearly everything in this climax except for the fighting in the sky. It's just a little goofy and I hope they don't necessarily keep it for the show. Unpopular opinion, I know, maybe. Maybe people really wanna see Rand in the sky, you know, fighting this flame masked figure, but I just couldn't picture it in a way that actually would come across well on screen. Putting it out there. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. But taking Lan's words from earlier in the book about sheathing your own sword, he manages to land a blow on this figure while also getting hit in the side and his battle is done. He also notices that like his ability to fight this person is directly tied with the forces down below. The better he does, the better they do, which is again, that kind of just forces of nature at work here that don't make it feel convenient. Instead, they make it feel almost like a religious scene. And then we have Min uh, taking Rand and helping him recover and Lanfear coming in and being like, hey, <laughs> I'm Lanfear, deuces. But then we have the other women coming in, all these people in love with Rand, but you know, 90s fantasy. And I end up loving everyone's relationships here, so I'm not that mad about it. We then get uh, the Moraine debrief, is what I'm referring to it as, because it happens in the first book and it's happening again here. Moraine debriefs, essentially, all the events that happened, and we are set up for what is to come. Matt is being sent off for proper healing. Um, you know, everyone is going back to the places they need to be. And there's this feeling of what is to come next, I was very much so left with, even though I know it was just a really strong vibe of like, hmm, like where where is this world going to go? Because if I didn't know, it feels like, okay, you won, but there's a lot to come. And there's a lot of problems that are going to lay into you. And I found myself also kind of just floored by the fact that there was originally not planned to be as many books and there was just planned to wrap up sooner. And with me knowing everything that happens, I can't imagine that being the case because there's still so much that needs to be done. And that probably sounds a little crazy to the people who are just reading along with me and have only read book two, but trust me, there, there, it needed to be as many books as it is. I will fight people on that any day. Maybe combine like two books, but outside of that, Jordan earned his page count. And I never got exhausted for one key reason, sip of water. Jordan is building one of the largest fantasy worlds that's ever existed, but he is the GOAT, the greatest of all time, in my humble opinion, at spending, you know, chapters doing some fantastic world building, but then sprinkling throughout 
really nice, small, beautiful moments that feel very natural in the narrative. Conflicts between friends, someone enjoying the city, taking in the ambiance. He's doing so much that is on this huge scale, but he so smoothly grounds you, the reader, into the environment and experiences just great little interactions between the characters you're falling in love with at this point that I, I genuinely don't think anyone's ever been as uh, subtle and effective with that element of storytelling as Jordan is. Uh, one of my actual continuing, like I'm always waging Malazan and Wheel of Time in my head now, like what's better there? But one of the things I think Wheel of Time has a clear advantage in is just the human element, the human feel that remains so strong from beginning to end of the whole series. And it's largely accomplished through this element of Jordan's writing. Overall though, I think The Great Hunt is probably roughly as solid, if not slightly better than Eye of the World. I hold them in very close regard and about an eight out of 10. I think they are rock solid fantasy books. And next up we have The Dragon Reborn, which I'm going to have some controversial opinions on because I know there's a lot of thoughts, but from there we're gonna go to book four, which I think is arguably the best of the entire series is where the Wheel of Time, and is where the Wheel of Time really becomes the Wheel of Time. But let me know what you thought of The Great Hunt in the comments down below. I know a lot of you are reading along just from the comments I've been getting and the sales I've gotten through the affiliate links on this video. So if you wanna keep reading along, I'll have affiliate links for book three right down there. Go ham. Like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon to go support what I do here. And have a good one, y'all. Peace.